Okay. Um, so let me begin by mentioning that we're recording tonight's talk. If you didn't want your comments um, to be recorded, um, yeah, please uh, refrain from making them or you can turn off your, your cameras as you wish. Um, thank you for joining tonight. Um, this is the last talk of the IMECI South Essex area uh, program for the year 2020 to 2021. Um, we didn't imagine that we'd be delivering every single talk online um, this time around, but here we are. So um, I'm pleased that we've been able to put something together at all for you. And it's a special honor for us to have Gordon, who's in our own committee, um, giving the final talk. So to give you some, some background on uh, Gordon himself. Gordon is a chartered mechanical engineer and a consultant and writer on energy technology and policy. And his career has included uh, 15 years with Ford Motor Company and um, further years with the energy and software industries. And Gordon has been writing and consulting on energy in buildings and transport from 1996 to date. Now, those who've been tracking our program all year um, may feel that there's been an especial focus on nuclear energy at the moment. Um, it is highly topical as, as people talk about renewals, renewables, they often also talk about nuclear energy. And uh, we, we certainly had one side of the argument, shall we say, recently from uh, Dr. Melanie Windridge's talk about the tokamak device, tokamak energy and how uh, she believed this will be um, an important energy source for the future. Um, as with all engineering matters, especially when technologies have not yet emerged and are not mature in the market, there is always an alternative view. And um, I think you can guess from the title that tonight's talk does indeed present that alternative view. Um, so we're going to uh, have Gordon's presentation and we would like to, uh, if we can, please keep Q&A to uh, chat comments at the end. So chat during the talk. If you do put in, I won't be addressing it because it can be a bit distracting. So we'll let Gordon run through his presentation and then we'll have a good Q&A session at the end. Um, so I, I'd like to thank Gordon again for joining, um, introduce you to Ahad Ramazimpour as well, who's the vice chair of the South Essex area. Um, if I do have to step away at the end for domestic reasons, then he'll take over and make sure that we get to the end in one piece. So thanks very much again. Uh, and Gordon, over to you. Thank you, Ken. Yeah. Right. So this is the ETER Tokamak fusion reactor being built in France. Although huge and costly at over 20 billion euros. It will only run in short bursts. So it has limited cooling and it will generate no electric power. Following this line by which I mean so-called full-size fusion power plants, a fusion power plant would be even bigger and could have at least three times the thermal output to produce around one gigawatt electrical. So fusion on Earth is often described as like the sun and other stars, but the nuclear physics is completely different. The sun uses the so-called proton-proton reaction, wherein hydrogen nuclei are converted to helium nuclei via several intermediates. This involves temperatures around 15 million degrees, but sun-like pressures cannot be achieved on Earth, at least using magnetic confinement. The Lawson paper of 1955 considered the deuterium-deuterium reaction with around 700 million degrees and the deuterium-tritium 
reaction with around 100 million degrees as candidates for fusion on Earth. These, you'll note, are both far hotter than the sun. Lawson also mentioned that to achieve fusion power requires a so-called triple product, plasma density, which is a function of pressure, temperature, and time. And with magnetic confinement, the pressure is stated to be a good vacuum. So it stands to reason that the others must be correspondingly higher. Fusion temperatures have been achieved. So one remaining challenge is the so-called confinement time. In other words, the duration of the, what you might call the burn. For plasmas in strong magnetic field, these are limited by instabilities. That's to say the confinement times are less so for large reactors. So fusion was achieved with the deuterium tritium reaction by the JET, Joint European Taurus reactor in Oxfordshire in 1997. But the thermal energy output was only 67% of break even and for only a very few seconds. So, this slide from Chris Llewellyn Smith in 2010 is headed progress, but in fact, there hadn't been any since 1997. There's no move towards energy break even at JET or elsewhere. Even so, he strongly supported the building of ITER, which is of gigawatt thermal scale. Again, due to Llewellyn and Smith, a fusion power plant would have a wall temperature of less than 550 C, probably using a primary coolant such as helium or molten salt to handle the very high heat fluxes. And this in turn, in fact, I can show you, you see a, a primary circuit followed by a secondary circuit for steam. Ah, so the steam cycle would typically have a top temperature of around 400 C, giving a thermal, that is to say first law efficiency of maybe 30%. If we were to pay any attention to the exegetic second law efficiency, it would be absolutely minuscule because we'd have started at 100 million degrees and thrown almost all of that away and ended up no better than a simple steam cycle. So because deuterium deuterium requires about 700 million degrees, but deuterium tritium only about 100 million degrees, fusion power would most likely use tritium. However, this is a radioactive isotope of the smallest molecule in the universe and much lighter than air, so may well leak and be lost from the plant. As we'll see, that's uh, crucial matter. Moreover, living things may ingest tritium or 
possibly tritiated water. In other words, tritium to oxygen as opposed to H2O. Releasing beta particles internally, causing harms such as cancers, deaths, and genetic damage. And all of that is on the record. It does happen. The liability of nuclear operators and fusion plants would be in this category. It's carried under legislation known as the UK Nuclear Installations Act of 1965. If you look this up, you find the liability is described as unquantifiable, uh, which I regard as approximately equal to infinity, which means an unlimited charge on the taxpayers. I hope you're aware of this. However, the operator is liable for the costs of decommissioning and waste storage as part of the cost of electricity. That's, of course, if they don't go broke in the meantime, as has happened, of course, with the British fission nuclear industry, which had to be bailed out by the government. Furthermore, the tokamak inner walls and blankets, which we'll define in a minute, suffer intense neutron bombardment, making them radioactive. The resulting damage requires them to be renewed about every two years. So they're segmented because they have to be contrived that is to say, removed from the vacuum chamber. After a lifetime of maybe 25 years, the entire fusion plant would require expensive decommissioning. So we're left with the plant and perhaps 12 sets of walls, which would require storage as radioactive nuclear waste. And as I've mentioned, it, uh, the costs of this uh, should rightfully be borne on the cost of electricity. So we have for the deuterium tritium reaction, deuterium, a stable isotope of hydrogen, but tritium is radioactive. Moreover, with a short half-life of 12.3 years. It can be produced by nuclear fission plants, especially heavy water reactors, such as the CANDU, uh, which we can say is originated in Canada, although there are some in India as well. But the world inventory insofar as you can nail it down, because it's constantly wasting away, is of the order 30 kilograms, and the price extremely high, $100 million a kilo. And one of its purposes is as a primer for nuclear bombs. So th those people will pay any price so that their toys will still go bang. But in the fusion context, an initial charge for a fusion plant of 20 kilos would cost 2 billion. Well, I hope they've budgeted for it uh, because there's a real question as to whether there's enough to even start up ITER which could be a little bit embarrassing. So we're looking at a hypothetical fusion plant of 3000 megawatt thermal, one gigawatt electrical, which would consume about 200 kilograms a year. 
well, patently, that could not be supplied by probably every can-do in the world if it was turned over to it. And of course, converting the can-do plant to produce the stuff at an enhanced rate, there is a downside and hence the high price. So the deuterium tritium plasma emits neutrons that heat the walls, which are cooled, as I've mentioned, by, for example, molten salt. And that heat's passed to the steam power cycle. The walls also include a blanket of lithium wherein some of the neutrons produce tritium. And this is the chain of events. A neutron hits lithium-7, creating a tritium ion, and a second neutron, which hits lithium-6, creates a second tritium ion. Now, that may seem plenty. But if you think about it, that would require intercepting all the neutrons. And there are necessities like structures, like heat exchangers, pipework, access, and heaven knows what else. So these authorities, Sawan and Abdu, 2005, showed that a required tritium breton ratio would be about 1.5 for a doubling time of two years. And we'll see the importance of doubling time in just a moment. 1.25 would suffice for five years, doubling time 1.15 for 10 years doubling time. And as an indication, 1.15 is about where we're at, so-called state of the art. So now we come to the issue of doubling time. We see here, dash lines 2.5 year doubling. So power sources which made a meaningful contribution to energy demand of the world get deployed with a doubling time of around two and a half years. Just a second. Uh, whoa. Mm. Right. So we see here the valley of death. And more importantly, we see here ETER, which, if all goes well, might produce fusion, DT fusion, in 2037. But of course, ETER is not a power plant. So to imagine a power plant, and it is pure imagination, because although it may have been schemed, it certainly hasn't been funded. Uh, that's known as demo. And only then could you even contemplate rolling out fusion power. But so this dotted red line is no hope whatsoever, nor even the blue. If you're lucky, as it might just produce the odd fusion power plant long after the deadline. 
So, now this diagram also plays a part because this is typical for a power plant. You have to invest energy in the material components of the plant. Uh, it sums to this at this point, energy invested. You can consider an energy payback time. Only then do you move into profit. And I should point out that this diagram is simplified notably in respect of the processes after the end of service, such as decommissioning and waste storage, which depending on the materials involved can be essentially forever uh, four and a half billion years as a half-life. I think that's forever in our terms. So compared with wind and solar PV, fusion lags by more than 50 years, so cannot contribute by 2050. But ITER and DEMO, et cetera, would require huge amounts of material and energy and hence greenhouse gases. And assuming the unit size is a gigawatt electrical and the target capacity to make a meaningful contribution is a terawatt electrical, the number of doublings we require are about 10 Now, if you imagine successive waves, then they obtain during the so-called exponential growth period. But if the doubling time is less than the construction time plus the energy payback time, then for all that time, the net energy production and hence the return on investment are negative. I don't think this will be welcomed. Tokamak Energy claims that a smaller unit of 100 megawatt electrical would be quicker to develop. They propose that it use a spherical tokamak as opposed to a more obvious toroid. So it's a bit like a, an apple with a core and high temperature superconducting magnets. But as part of the run up to ITER, the mainstream, the so-called power plant study shows that the cost of electricity from fusion varies as the, the 0.4 power of the rated power. This, this is hardly surprising as for all chemical plant, you can broadly say that its cost varies to the capacity as the capacity to the power are roughly 0.6. So compared with a unit of one and a half gigawatt electrical, which is the largest that's been mentioned, the cost of energy for a unit of 100 megawatts electrical would be three times as high. So that would appear to be something of a blind alley. 
So now back to the power plant study. And they gave themselves a lot of leeway by talking about <coughs> the cost for the tenth of a kind. And in, this is the less ambitious design, water-cooled steel fusion plant. This real interest rate. And they were projecting nine euro cents a kilowatt hour. But also in the literature, and I've found all these references online, open literature, downloadable for free, in order to carry out a due diligence exercise. And we have this, the Bechtel estimates, which gave a plant cost of $15 billion, this amount of the rated power, 15,000 per kilowatt electrical of rated power at a plant factor, capacity factor of 0 0.8 and annual charges of 17%. That's just what was in the Bechtel estimates. I'm not second guessing them. The capital charges alone would be 36 cents a kilowatt hour. So bringing that up to the megawatt hour basis, cost of electricity range is nine to 36 cents per kilowatt hour, 90 to 360 dollars <clears throat> per megawatt hour. I'm blurring the difference or ignoring the difference between euros and dollars at this scale, it's not important. Now, here we have Mr. Grubler, who's carried out uh, retrospective studies of the nuclear fission industry, specifically those in the US, red over here on the left, and in France on the right. So these countries had the largest fleets of power plants, mostly of standardized designs, yet they still roared away in cost. One reason for the increase was so-called legislative creep which results from concerns about nuclear safety. Indeed, as we see here, the investment costs skyrocketed after Chernobyl in 1986. On the other hand, here we have the record for solar PV and wind and you get a positive learning effect and of major degree and significant here in wind. So at 22% per annum, the learning rate for solar PV is particularly large. Now that, of course, is due to many suppliers. So there is competition. And re reduced cost and increased efficiency per unit area. And likewise, in wind, there are order of 10, maybe 20 suppliers, real competition, even in the, if you like, the senior league. And sure enough, 
it resulted in a genuine learning effect. And this has been also noted for offshore. Another factor is that both PV and wind turbines have small unit size, a small granularity, which lends itself to factory production, not building it from a kit of parts in the outdoors, as is usual for these huge gigawatt scale fission and fusion plants. Also, with this smaller granularity, it's possible to finance or any one purchaser to finance a plant within their means. So large unit size of a gigawatt, long construction times, not sure we can move this, but it says about 10 years, imply automatically a low learning rate, 10 years and everybody's forgotten what they learned. Also, if they had to be done sequentially, well, very likely in another country, again, no learning. So Grubler found the learning rate of nuclear fission power plants in France and US to be negative, yet the cost of electricity from solar PV is expected to fall from 8.5 cents per kilowatt hour in 2018 to two to eight, quite a range, in 2030. And I omitted it, but the same reference gives a cent to five, I believe it is, by 2050. So, and these can be compared with these numbers from the Department of Building. Oh. Anyhow, it's, it used to be called DEC, Department of Energy and Climate Change, but anyhow, it's, uh, so it's a ministry of the UK government under the latest name change. But anyhow, they commissioned this study, and as we see, large solar PV 44, onshore wind 46, offshore wind 57, projected for to 2025, gas 85, and of course variable. Who knows what the price of gas will be? One thing we do know, gas is a depletable and the others are renewables. So this is perhaps the core of my presentation. I've drawn on four particular critics of nuclear power. Most of whom have spent decades in fusion research. So they're exceptionally well informed. So I, it's worth mentioning at this point that I have posted on my website a, what I call a document with references. So all the references I've drawn on are given with the URL web address and they can all be downloaded for free. And in that document I've given for convenience extended 
quotations. So you, you can judge for yourselves whether these extracts are representative, but most of them are actually the titles of the documents. So evidently William Parkins of Rockwell International, he must have been benefiting from uh, US federal funds even back then. Will it ever come? Daniel Jaspi from Princeton, PPPL, for those in the business, uh, was of this opinion ETER as a showcase for the drawbacks. Oops, sorry. Uh -oh. Yeah. Uh, Michael Dittmar is not a fusion researcher, but he does work in the nuclear physics field. And again, comes from a top institution, ETH Zurich, Switzerland. 2019, is it time to terminate the project? Uh, well, if you want to know his answer, it's yes. And here is my star witness, Mohammed Abdu from UCLA. Quote, the state of the art will not enable demo and future power plants to satisfy tritium self-sufficiency. What that means is game over. Because if the fusion plant can't generate the tritium, nothing else can in the quantities required. And in any case, at the price, so the initial charge, 20 kilos, 2 billion, and annual consumption, 200 kilos, 20 billion a year. However, there are, there is light ahead, sunlight and energy efficiency and savings. Now, this is the first question which should have been asked in the first place because Energy supply is not a given or not of a given magnitude is not a given. And for example, today's magnitude, that's not a given. There's always another option. And indeed, engineers are often rewarded for finding developing and deploying these options. So Cullen and Allwood work at the largest department of engineering in the UK, that in Cambridge. And they've produced two, what can, truly be called seminal studies. And they cover the following areas. The first is energy conversion. And just to conceptualize it, that often means a thermodynamic machine, like an internal combustion engine, or a heat pump and real, if they all operated at their theoretical efficiency and in the case of the internal combustion engine or the heat pump, engineers would think of the Carnot efficiency. 
That alone would reduce global energy demand by almost 90%. But of course, we know, even given the mission and the huge budget, uh, we couldn't achieve that. But we can achieve at volume about half this. For example, in volume produced car engines or refrigerators or air conditioners. So they means Cullen and Allwood who were joined for the second report by Borgstein and he found or they together found that achievable changes to the passive systems could save 73% of demand. Now, if we go back to the refrigerator we were just talking about, this is the refrigeration machine, and this is the cabinet. So combining the converters and the passive systems with this factor a half here, you can see that the global energy savings could be 85%. Now, I refer you to the two studies, which are very substantial. And as well as the papers, there are big supplementary information files but they're well worth downloading and studying and still hold good because to, to an almost disgraceful extent, this is the road not taken. But whereas we should have taken it first. So here we have day to day evidence. We're all aware and even the government is mandating a change from not just incandescent lights but the latest move is to in popular terms ban the halogen lights and even fluorescent lights for near-term dates. It's today's news and I've, uh, anyhow, they're two years and four years ahead, something like that, simply because there's nothing you, that can't be served with LEDs and LEDs have still got further potential like factor two, if you're prepared to pay, look up the Dubai lamps, D-U-B-A-I. There's a YouTube on it, tells you all you need to know. Much electricity in industry, homes, commerce, etc., drives pumps and fans rotodynamic pumps, if we're being fussy. And these are well known to engineers as following a cube law. That is to say the power consumption varies as the cube of the speed. And nowadays we have so-called electronic drives and from the likes of ABB. And of course there are other suppliers. And the, the typical experience is annual savings of 50 to 80%. Very well worthwhile on units large and small. And in the electronic drives, otherwise termed inverter drives, but I'm using that term because it's used 
in the refrigeration and aircon industry. So same thing applies, similar savings. And I emphasize delivering these savings at scale and speed is possible because all end use devices are made in many factories. rather than being assembled in the open air. Okay. So we have in mind that we've addressed diminishing the energy demand from of the order of 30 terawatts. So we're, here are a number of authors in the literature. This is Llewellyn Smith once again. So that will probably be papers of around 2010. He made his own estimates. Uh, Jacobson has high profile. Uh, but these are, uh, so does Breyer. He operates in Finland, but he's actually a German. Anyhow, we have a range of numbers for each of the renewable energy sources, but some mix of these taken with the savings should meet the case. So where we saw the doubling time graph, the same author in the Netherlands, he projected on that graph, world energy demand 2050 as 30 terawatts, he too failed to take account of the huge scope for energy saving. Elsewhere in the literature, major demand reductions are advocated by these two. They work in Australia and are very often joint authors of their series of papers. Anderson, this is Kevin Anderson of the Tyndall Center in the UK. And we're recapping the findings of Colin Allwood and Borgstein. 2010 and 11, 85%. Therefore, world energy demand would be well within the potentials of renewables. So, to the conclusions. I start with that all important thing, safety. If it's not safe and it proves itself, as in, for example, Chernobyl or Fukushima, to be unsafe, then it'll be shut down, as happened in Japan. They shut down all the, the nuclear fission plants. Only a very few have restarted. So we have wasted assets sitting there. Well, actually wasted liabilities because they'd all have to be decommissioned and all the waste will have to be stored forever. And that won't be for free. So this is crunch point for fusion power plants. Q, often used for a gain and amplification. Well, the projection that the mainstream people 
are talking of is 10. Even though they've yet to achieve a one. The tritium breeding ratio being generous 1.25. Abdu talks of 1.15. And competitive cost of energy, putting it very mildly, have yet to be demonstrated. Now, for a doubling time of even five years, and that corresponds with the 1.25, the exponential growth period would be about 50 years. So that takes us way, uh, let's say roughly 2100. And along with it, if the construction time, uh, it might be five or 10 years, during this exponential growth period, for the 10 doublings, we'd be getting nothing from the fleet. Not a pretty sight. We've seen that learning curves for fission is negative. We've every reason to expect it'll be also negative for fusion. One reason is that fusion hasn't yet taken on board the kind of extra measures for radioactive shielding and the like that fission has adopted post Chernobyl. And the authority which is saying this is IRSN of France, and they know what they're talking about. So we can absolutely anticipate that fusion will also have negative learning. In other words, we may not have made the provision for ETER, but DEMO will need it, and who knows, but others even more. And it's worth mentioning in passing that tokamak energy cannot carry out extended burns on their ST40 pilot plant because they haven't got any radiation shielding. So they'd have to move to another building and set up radiation shielding, even to carry out the experiments. So I think I've said enough about the well-informed critics. We note with the best authority that the indications are we could save up to 85%. It follows by what's known as the zero sum game. You can't say spend the same money twice. So spending money, time, energy, greenhouse gas emissions and talent on fusion means less spent on energy use, solar PV, wind and storage. Now the difference is that fusion doesn't work and can't work in time, whereas PV, wind and storage and energy efficiency do work and can be delivered on time. So that's my thinking for saying fusion power is not just futile in itself, but actually counterproductive in addressing the climate crisis. However, I don't want to end on a negative note. 
And I want all those watching and all those they tell about this presentation, uh, which is being recorded, so it'll be watchable later, that here are the merits of taking the energy savings and renewables road. They avoid the risk of human harm, says here, from tritium leaks and other radioactive components. These measures leave no radioactive waste for future generations. We've given far too little thought to that. We're leaving a monstrous radioactive debt for some future generations, in some instances, all future generations, to look after, to keep it away from the biosphere. Come what may, even if there be storm, earthquake, civil commotion, World War III, it must not be released to the biosphere. So as you can imagine, long-term repositories are not cheap. And as you can also imagine, most countries are ducking the issue, most notably the US, Russia, China, and UK, and indeed everybody else apart from the Finns. However, even their design has a fatal flaw. They propose to seal the radioactive waste in iron canisters sheathed with copper. However, they fail to take account of the fact that radioactive reactions decay, continue to take place and Following some, if not all, of the decay chains, one of which goes from uranium-235 to lead, along the way, the product is not a solid, but a gas. And that gas can rupture the canister. Oops! Yes, so back to the drawing board on that one. So at least by declining the fusion offer, uh, we can avoid that, that increment. Energy savings and renewables work in every country so it doesn't need, for example, a national grid. They can be decentralized systems fed by solar PV and wind turbines because the granularity is right. They don't have to have this so-called technological priesthood, which seemingly we have to pay for if we take the nuclear option. And huge opportunities to investors and employees, certainty of meeting the climate challenge, and this brings satisfaction and rewards to both the investors and the employees. What better career could you wish for? Thank you. Uh.
Oh, and here is the link. So on my website, on the nuclear page, posted this afternoon, are the two documents, this presentation and the document with all the references. And there's my email address, uh, welcome email responses, as well as, of course, the Q&A, which we're looking forward to. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Thanks very much for your presentation. So um, thanks to the audience for um, keeping all the microphones uh, on mute, staying off the chat as we went through the talk. It's greatly appreciated. Um, if people do now want to ask questions, please, um, would you raise them in the chat? I'll just give you a moment to um, either type something in or if you think it's a long question and you just want to type your name in and I'll, I'll just come to you like that. Uh, where is it? Um, Ken, I can't uh, seem to find the chat. Um, uh, Ah, okay. Maybe if you come out of the full screen on your yeah, I've done presentation. That. Well, at and least then, I think I've done it. Well, in my Zoom, it's uh, I think view and chat, or you press the chat button at the bottom. Oh gosh. Oh, there, there are no questions. There are no questions entered. Um, oh, I so, I think, I think you have a stunned the audience into. Into silence and submission. Uh, do I have to stop sharing in order to access? Uh, you, you could do yeah. that. That would, you know, enable everyone's video to go on screen. But that—that's all. You don't have to no. stop sharing there. Uh, well, I've I've opened a box. Okay, we we don't have uh, we don't have. Um, competition. So if people want to unmute and call a question out, I'm going to invite somebody now, if they'd wish to do that, please take the stage and ask your question to Gordon. Hmm. Do you, I mean, from my side, perhaps if I just started off, do you think the... Um, <laughs> It might be a strange question, but do you think we'll ever be able to live in the presence of the materials that are currently, you know, so dangerous? Do you, is there perhaps a plan to contain them differently or to treat them some other way, bring them down to a, let's say, a more bearable level of harm? Is is such a thing ever spoken of, or is that all uh, just never going to happen? Well, occasionally, uh, one which was mooted a long time ago was to embed the radioactive waste in glass. Uh, but <laughs> as I've just mentioned, this the decay chain contains solids and notably gases don't know about liquids, uh, strikes me it would have to be something to resist you know, this uh, breakup. Um, in other words, the first priority for the entire nuclear industry is to put significant amounts of money into exactly that stand up and, what's the word, accept or acknowledge your responsibility 
for protecting future generations. So rather than building power plants, for example, there's that famous saying, when in a hole, stop digging. <laughs> right? So uh, they need to, I think the term nowadays is own. Yes, own the problem. Yes, right. Well, they can be part of the solution. Indeed. That is the sole function in my eyes of, and of course, in the British case and the American case, if you look at the, the expenditures of the Department of Energy in the US, it's almost all bombs and radioactive waste. Mm. And likewise in the UK, BEIS, you know, just a few scraps can be found for energy research. There you go. All right, um, Gordon, I think we have a, an audience with maybe a little bit of Zoom fatigue given yep. the hot weather. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm just going to uh, stop the recording.